I was in a church in Mexico about two or three years ago, and of course everybody that was teaching at the conference spoke Spanish except for me. <clears throat> and I was listening to one of the messages, and the only word I understood in the entire message was the word taco. And, uh, and the pastor repeated it about 40 times. I could not figure out why he would say the word taco 40 times. But I thought about it, and I said, you know, if someone had told me if I got saved, I would get tacos, I would probably have gotten saved a lot earlier in my life, you know. Uh, guys, uh, usually when I come to a church, I talk about our work in southern Sudan. Uh, we have been involved in the longest-running civil war in Africa. Uh, that country has been at war literally for 65 years. And uh, about 23 years ago, we became the official training arm for the South Sudanese Army of training all pastors and chaplains. <clears throat> They're not like we think of chaplains in America. They're combat chaplains. We're all armed. We all go into battle. And, uh, and uh, we lose a lot of men in the service of Christ over there. Uh, but this morning, I won't be sharing about that. Uh, we are not a small organization. We're actually a very large organization. We're operating in 37 countries around the world. And uh, when Afghanistan collapsed overnight, we had a tremendous problem in our ministry. Uh, we have a division of our ministry, we call it ghost operations. It's the invisible hand into the closed world of radical Islam. And we have 400 missionaries in the underground in nine of the 10 most dangerous Islamic countries in the world. Well, in Afghanistan, we had 22 missionaries there. With their families, it was over 200 people. I got a call from our Dutch office and they said, Wes, with their extended families, there's over 200 people. They're all expecting to be killed for their faith. So I went to my staff and I said, we're going into wartime operations. One week later, five former Navy SEALs would fly in, three Marines, all Special Forces, one Army Green Beret, <clears throat> and one brother with the CIA. And uh, we planned operations into Afghanistan. Shortly after that, we would send in two teams simultaneously. Uh, the first one would fly in a chopper and land at 12,000 feet and would deploy Marines and SEALs there. I went with the second team and uh, we were told we were gonna climb two to 4,000 feet, but we'd have to walk climb to 11,500 feet to get to where we're going. And then we launched our drones, and what we're looking for is what's called a rat line. A rat line is an escape route of how to get people out of the country. I can't tell you more than that, guys, because this is an ongoing operation that we're involved in right now. Uh, but when we got over there, then God began to do miracles. And one of the things that I want to share with you is that so often God wants to use his people, but we look in and of our own skill set, what we know. But if it's outside of our skill set, we don't know what to do, and we often do not even attempt to allow God to use us the way that he wants to use us. Uh, if you ask me how to fight a war in southern Sudan, I can tell you. I've been there for 26 years. I know how to fight a war very well in southern Sudan. But I had no knowledge of what to do in Afghanistan. A lot of the teams did, but not myself personally. And so uh, when we were going up that mountain, guys, it was truly the most difficult climb of my life. Uh, and all of the guys with me said the same thing. Uh, when I got off the mountain, all my toenails were black because of the blood that was under them. Uh, there was really no trail going up the mountain. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a wild goat they call an ibex. Uh, they got massive horns, and uh, probably 5% of the mountain had what we would call an ibex trail, which is about six inches. But if you missed a foot, you literally fell a thousand feet and you died. And I was coming down the side of one mountain, I began to hear someone slide, and I did have time to think about it. I just reached back and I grabbed and I caught our interpreter as he was going off the side of the mountain. Uh, one of the brothers that was on our team, Rodney, was with the elite SEAL Team 6. Uh, 22 years with the SEALs, 12 years with SEAL Team 6, and 13 years with the CIA. Well, he lost three toenails on that mountain, so that tells you how hard the climb was there. But then the Lord began to do miracles. We got a call from YWAM, Youth with a Mission, and they said, our country director is in the city of Maz. Uh, the Taliban knows he's there. They wrote a letter before the collapse, and they said, you're a traitor to Islam, we're going to massacre you, we're going to slaughter you, there is no forgiveness for you. When they called me, they said, Wes, they're within two hours of finding this kid. And I said, guys, you should have got a hold of us a long time before this. Two hours is not a lot of time. But fortunately, I had Luke on my staff. Luke spent 14 years in the Marine Corps Special Forces. He was an officer. And then 22 years in the FBI counterterrorism. Uh, he speaks fluent Arabic in multiple dialects. Uh, plus, he's got a good grasp of five of the languages. He's tested at genius level. And uh, 
I said, look, can we get a hold of any asset in this country? Fortunately, we were able to get a hold of some Pakistani mercenaries, and we paid them to go and pick the kid up. And an hour later, they showed up at the door, we got the kid and got him out of there. And an hour later, Taliban was at the door. Had we not got there, they would have killed this kid. And then we got a call from uh, Heather Mercer. Some of you may remember that name. She's a very famous missionary. She was put in prison by the Taliban back in 2000. When the United States went in there and took over Afghanistan, the US forces released her, I believe it was in 2001. And uh, she called up and she said, I have uh, 28 people in country. They are believers and they will all be killed by the Taliban. So we put together an operational team. We went in and got those 28 out. But the one that surprised me the most, guys, is we got a call from Shannon Spam. Mike Spam uh, was the first CIA officer killed in Afghanistan back in 2001. And I remember it like it was yesterday because it troubled me. Uh, they trusted the Taliban to keep to an honor system, which I knew was a very big mistake. And Mike had been in the uh, Marine Corps. He was uh, an officer. He was in Special Forces. He was recruited by the CIA. Shannon was also recruited by the CIA. They met at the farm, which was a training base. They fell in love, got married, had three kids. And so when they went in, they went in with the Alpha team, which was the first team in. And, uh, uh, and of course, Mike had been killed. But Shannon called us up, and uh, she said that, I have 26 people, they are not believers, but they all help the U.S. government. Will you guys help me? And guys, uh, Brent, who's on my staff, Brent was in Second Force Recon in the Marine Corps, which is the elite of the Marine Corps Special Forces. And he said, what do you want to do, brother? I said, let's green light the operation. So we went in and we got those 26 out. But what became of this was such an amazing thing is that we had the military experience. We had the tier one type guys, but we lacked a lot in the intelligence side of knowing how to do things. Well, guys, Shannon, uh, has access to every intelligence office in the world. She can walk in there and they will help her. And Shannon told us that she said when Afghanistan began to collapse, she said at first she was getting a lot of people out because of her connections in the CIA. But when the last US aircraft left, she could not get anybody out of Afghanistan. And she said so she, uh, <clears throat> she uh, was walking around one night and she was praying. She said, Lord, what do I do? And the Lord said, Shannon, why are you going to the world? Why are you not going to my people? She goes, well, Lord, I don't know your people. Well, he gave her the name of a gentleman. I do not know this person. But when she, when she called him, he said, Shannon, call Far Reaching Ministries. And uh, so she called us. And, and uh, Shannon, after the operation was uh, happened, she, she flew out to California to meet with me. And she said, when I first heard about you, I went to your website and I began to read it. And guys, if you're not a believer, it's very hard to understand. It looks like some kind of military organization or something like Blackwater. You know, it's not, uh, if you're not a Christian, you would not understand it very well. And uh, she said, I looked at the website, and so I called this guy up, and I said, who's Wes Bentley, who's Far Reaching Ministries, and who's Brett? And he said, Shannon, if my family was in Afghanistan, these are the two men that I would want to go and get them. And so one of the things that came out of this, guys, Shannon is now a part of our team. And she's helped us tremendously in the intelligence world of being able to go in and get people out of Afghanistan. We got a call. Uh, the first female Supreme Court justice uh, was in a certain city. The Taliban was hunting her. When the Taliban kills women, the first thing they do is they rape them. And the reason they say they do this is because by raping them, they cannot enter into paradise. It's an absolute lie. They do it because they're despicable, disgusting human beings. But they use it as an excuse. Once they've raped the girl, they, they have them stripped down, they hold them upside down, and they cut their throats. Well, they wanted to make an example out of this lady, so, that, uh, you know, of course, we got a call and we were able to send an operational team to get them out also. And guys, this was just the beginning of many, many miracles. Uh, so far, we've gotten over 1,000 people out of Afghanistan. But the problem that we have is there's over 3,500 more people that are asking us to get them out. The United States government, all foreign governments, all foreign agencies have all pulled out of Afghanistan. We are literally the last people that are left there. And it's a tremendous amount of responsibility to try to save these lives there. Uh, there were some amazing things that happened during this time. I got a call from a US intelligence officer. He called and said, can I fly to your office and meet with you? And I said, sure. Well, he literally flew out the same day. I was surprised by this. And he came to my office and he said, Wes, I, I, he goes, I don't know if you know this, but the entire intelligence world is talking about you and your ministry. And I said, why in the world would the intelligence world be talking about us? 
He said, we're American intelligence, and we can't get anybody out of Afghanistan. You're a Christian organization, and you're getting all kinds of people out. What are you doing? So guys, I opened up the Bible, and I spent the next 45 minutes explaining what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, this guy, as an active intelligence agent, came to work for us. He still works for the government, but he's working for us. He said, the government won't do their job, so I'm going to help you guys. And he's absolutely a rock star in helping us to get people out of there. But he said that when I was over in Afghanistan in January on my second trip over there, guys, I rotated in a second time. Uh, I got a message from him through Signal, which is a private way of communicating. And he said, when I met you, he goes, I was a Catholic that had walked away from faith many years ago. But after watching you and the way that your people behave, he goes, I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm now a believer. So, guys, it's been a great thing to see the fruit of that life. Shannon has, has, has a friend who's a New York Times bestselling writer, and he wrote the movie 12 Strong. Probably a lot of you guys have seen that movie. And he called Shannon up. He said, Shannon, what is in it for 4 ministry? She goes, nothing. He goes, no, really, what is in it for them? She goes, there's nothing in it for them. They're doing it because they love Christ and they love these people. And he's not a believer, but he said, you know, I have been watching both secular and Christian organizations. Everybody that is over there is advertising who they are. They want to get on the news. They want to raise support. They want everybody to know what they're doing, except for far-reaching ministries. He goes, they're the only organization out there. They're a ghost. You hear nothing about them. He goes, what is in it for them? She goes, nothing. Now, here's a non-believer, and he goes, you know, it's like Jesus turning over the money changer tables. And guys, if that is enough for me in eternity, if we reach this one man's life for Christ, that's all that matters to me. We have a tremendous problem within the body of Christ today. A lot of people who are in ministry are in it for the fame and the fortune of what they might receive. Almost every missionary that goes to the field today wants to write a book. And guys, they all write their own books. They get them self-published. Between the ones they sell and they distribute to their family, they probably have a distribution of about 40 to 70 books. You know, not a great success. But they want to do it because they're trying to become popular. And I've literally had 20 people try to get me to write a book, and I've refused. And I'm not saying that if the Lord tells me to at some point, I will. You see, I feel like this is the book that we need to give the world. And we're sharing our testimonies, which does have some value. But the hope for the world is not a mission organization or an individual. The hope for the world is Jesus Christ. And this is what we need to be presenting to them. And, you know, I, I, there are so many pastors out there, and they don't even realize it, but they're not storing any treasures in heaven. Because why they're doing it, their motives are wrong. They want big churches. They want lots of money so they can do the things that they want. They want to be famous. They want to be popular. Often they refuse to teach the Word of God anymore because they don't want people to leave their church. They give a very friendly message. Jesus loves you. He's your best friend. Do you want to be his best friend? Which is a lot of nonsense, you know. This is not why Christ came into the world. He came to set us free from sin. And there's a responsibility of surrendering one's life to Christ. And uh, there was an incident that happened overseas that really earmarked everything for me. There was a family, they got themselves out of Afghanistan. We did not get them. But YWAM asked us to go and meet with them. Uh, we went to the country that was bordering it. We went to a restaurant there. Uh, YWAM had set up the lunch there. And guys, it was a beautiful Afghan restaurant. And this mother comes with her mother. And she has two daughters, one that was six uh, at the time and one was four, and a young son. Both of the mothers' husbands had been killed by the Taliban. But the younger mother begins to tell us what happened to her. The man that killed her husband was his own brother. And guys, I have been in war for 26 years of my life. I've seen a tremendous amount of killing, a tremendous amount of dead bodies. In all the years that I have been in war zones, I have never seen anybody that was butchered so bad. He tortured his brother for three days, then he killed him, then he raped his brother's wife, and he raped his brother's four-year-old daughter. The six-year-old witnessed it, and she was the one that was the most traumatized by it because she just could not process what was going on. Fortunately, the four-year-old doesn't really remember it that we know of right now. She seems to have forgotten what happened to her. She was too young, and we pray that it will stay that way. But as I was talking to the mother, and we had this beautiful meal, and they're eating, but there's no joy in their face. And guys, I don't think they'd had a good meal in months. 
Uh, their clothing looked like they hadn't changed it for weeks, if not months. They probably left with just the clothing on their back. And they're eating, but there's no joy. Now, when you're hungry, you eat, you have joy in eating, but they don't have any of this. They're too traumatized by this. And the mother said to me, my brother-in-law is contacting me through my other relatives. And he's telling me that if I do not return, he will kill all 14 members of my family. Well, when she said that, the six-year-old just starts to weep and sob. She just starts crying. She's terrified that her mother's going to go back to Afghanistan to save her family. And I said to the mother, Jesus said, come to me, all you burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I said, you cannot put the safety of your adult family above that of the children. Now, that being said, if your family's willing to go, I'll send an operational team to get them out. But when we show up, they have to leave immediately. If they're not ready, we're leaving and we're not coming back. And we have been able to complete that operation. Guys, when we got done, the children were dressed in basically rags. So we took them to buy new clothing for them. And that little girl, when she got up from the table, she walked over and she put her arms around my waist and she just began to cry. And I leaned over and I kissed her on top of the head. I go, honey, do not worry. I will not let anybody hurt your family. She would not let go of my hand the rest of the time I was there. When we went to the clothing store, it almost got humorous because she'd be trying to put her arm through one piece of clothing, but she wouldn't let go of my hand, you know. And I go, honey, you can let go of my hand. I'll take it afterwards. When I went back in January, guys, she was telling everybody, my grandfather's coming, my grandfather's coming. Because one of the things that God spoke to me during this time is that she is to be my daughter the rest of my life. Now, she will not live with me, but God has given me the responsibility of watching over her life, making sure they get to a safe country, that they have jobs, they're fed, she goes to a school. And I believe that in the days that we're living in, God has this message for many people within the church. One of my favorite people in the Word of God is the prophet Jeremiah. Hey, guys, there's a lot of reasons why I like the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is unique among prophets of the Lord. He's not only a prophet, but he's a priest. And what is unique about that, there are only three prophets in the Old Testament that are priests. It's Jeremiah, Zechariah, and Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is a contemporary of Jeremiah. The job of the priest is to bring people into close fellowship with their God. Well, Jeremiah served somewhere between 40 and 50 years, but the people of Israel never repent. And God sends the Babylonian Empire and conquers them and takes them off into captivity for 70 years. See, guys, if you look at Jeremiah's life, you might think that he failed in ministry. Jeremiah did not fail in ministry. He just never lived to see the fruit of his ministry. <clears throat> but out of Jeremiah's life, there would be great fruit. Out of Jeremiah's life would come Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Out of his life would come the prophet Daniel. <clears throat> out of his life would come Ezekiel. And when King Nebuchadnezzar built a golden altar and commanded the whole world to bow down and worship it, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had seen what happened when a nation rejected their God. And they say to the king, they said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, our God has the ability to deliver us. But whether he delivers us or not, we will not bow down to your God. And they are thrown into the fiery furnace, and God delivers them. And an entire generation knows who the living God is because of Jeremiah. Seventy years later, it will be Daniel's turn. Once again, he's told to worship a false god. He refuses. He's thrown into a lion's den. Once again, God delivers him. And another entire generation knows who the living God is because of the prophet Jeremiah. But guys, it wasn't just them. It was Ezekiel. And one of the things that Ezekiel says, Ezekiel says twice in the book of Ezekiel, he says, we're to go to the sinners, we're to tell them about their sin. If we do not go to the sinners and we do not tell them about their sin, God will require their blood on our head. And guys, one of the things that God tells us is that we have a responsibility to warn people of the consequences of unrepentant sin. We're living in a generation where what the Bible said would happen in the last days is exactly happening. That good would be called evil and evil would be called good. We had the problem with the whole gay homosexual movement today. And they're trying to pass laws that we're not allowed to tell them it's a sin. You see, God says if you don't tell them. Now, guys, we're not there to persecute them. And there's a great lie out there. They're saying that the church is persecuting the homosexual community. Well, first of all, guys, it's a lie. It never was true. Are there some small people who call them Christians that might have done this? Yes. But by and large, truthfully, the church didn't do its job. They didn't care. <clears throat> they really 
did not share. They just kept their mouth shut because they didn't consider it important. But see, if you don't share and they go to hell, then you will be responsible in eternity for these people. And it's love that calls us to do this. Now, guys, as a believer, I have led 10 homosexual women to Christ. Not one single male, but 10 women. And one of the things I share with them, I said, I want you to hear me out. First of all, I don't hate you. I'm not against you. You will tell me that you were born this way. But the problem with that argument is that the serial killer will say he was born this way. The pedophile will say he was born this way. The boy that wants to sleep with every girl in his church will say he was born this way. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born out of a life of sin into a life with Christ. And I said, all sin will separate us unless we repent of it. And guys, through that, I've led ten to the Lord. Now, if they reject the message, we don't have to do anything. We're finished. We can move on. But see, Ezekiel warned us that if we did not share it, and see, our children are being brainwashed. And guys, we're getting to the point in our nation that it's got too far. One of the girls who volunteers in my office is in the medical field. And she was telling them that they have a case right now where a family is trying to get their four-year-old child a sex change. Now, this child doesn't understand anything about this. They're saying that this child thinks he's whatever he is. He's not a boy. He's not a girl. They're trying to do it. Truthfully, they're willing to sacrifice their child so that they can be a hero of the movement. That's what they're willing to do because they see it as popular. My grandson is three years old, three years old. He wants to be a puppy. Now, should I have a tail sewn onto the back of him? Should I have dog hormones injected in his body? He doesn't know what he believes. There was a kindergarten school where they brought in strippers and brought them into the school and had to put dollar bills into the G-strings of the strippers. And they're saying this is good. When do we not realize it's time to say enough is enough? We may have to go to war in this country to defend our families. I really believe that's a very real possibility. But there's a point that we have to say enough is enough. See, as Christians, you're supposed to fight for what is right. You know, guys, when I went to Africa, I did not go there to be a soldier. Now, I am a soldier. I lied about my age when I was in the 10th grade and joined the United States Marine Corps. And I was a pretty highly trained soldier. I was deployed to an amphibious raider battalion. I trained at the SEAL base, the Ranger base, Army Ranger base. We had our own specialized training. And I was a top competitive shooter in the Marine Corps. Uh, my coach actually said to me, Wes, you are so good with weapons, I think you could shoot the Olympics. Well, I never wanted to shoot the Olympics. I just wanted to shoot other people. So I had no <laughs> interest in going down that road. But when I came to Christ, it transformed everything about me. But I remember that when I first went to Africa, guys, when you go to the mission field, you do not go there, like I said, to make a name. You go there because the love of Christ calls you. The Bible says it's the love of God that compels people under repentance. And what began to happen was rebels were coming down and attacking villages around us. One village, they took 58 children and they crushed their heads against trees. They would come in and rape every girl from the age of nine years old to as old as a young girl could be or a woman could become. After they were done, the most beautiful women, they would take into sexual slavery. But the women they did want, they'd cut their noses off, their lips off, their ears off, their breasts off, their fingers off. They wanted to bring great terror, and they were extremely effective about doing that. And the Lord told me, you have got to protect these women and children. So we began to build sanctuaries for the women and children to come in at night. When the sun would begin to set, at first you would see a trickle. But by the time the sun went down, over 44,000 women and children at night were coming in looking for safety against the rebels. Among the South Sudanese army, they are great warriors. They're extremely tenacious in battle, but often they would fight extremely hard until they realized they could not win a battle, and then they would pull back and say, live to fight another day. One of the villages they pulled out of, me and my men went into afterwards. The Islamic army came down, they built these huge bonfires, and they picked up all the babies and the toddlers, and they threw them in and they burned them alive. And the Lord told me, you've got to do something about this. So I sent the men down. I said, guys, I want you to understand something here. I go, it is not your job to save your life. It is your job to save their lives. We are men, they are women and children. If the enemy comes, not one of you guys is to pull off that line until we have evacuated every single woman and child. If you die, then you die. That is the role of the man. We are called to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. Guys, about five years ago, we had a rebel unit probing our village, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 guerrillas. 
and they were coming for the women for sex slaves and the children to be soldiers. And I had to send my men out into the field. Every night we would go out as the sun was setting, and we would not come back in until the sun rose. This went on for several months. And my standing order was intercept them and kill them all. Don't you let a single one get away. Now, if they surrender, will I take them prisoner? Of course I will. And people will come up to me and say, well, what about that scripture that says turn the other cheek? Well, turn the other cheek means take an offense for the gospel. It never meant to let them rape your wife, your daughter, to sell them into sexual slavery, to murder children and to burn them alive. I do not know why the church doesn't understand that. As men, we have a God-given right to protect women and children. And guys, one of the things that I tell men in this world, I said, when God made you strong, it was for a purpose. It wasn't so that you could attract women and sleep with as many as you could. The reason he made you that way is so that you could protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. This is how men are supposed to live their lives. We are to live lives that are above reproach, and yet we are not doing it. There's a great weakness within men today. They're not committed to their marriages. They're not committed to their jobs. They're really not committed to anything but themselves. And that is not the life of a godly man. When King David is dying, he talks to his son Solomon. And guys, when you're dying, you say the things that you've always needed to say. Often a husband will say to a wife, I wish I had told you I loved you more. I wish I had done these things. But what does King David say to Solomon? He says, Solomon, be strong and therefore prove yourself to be a man. A part of being strong, being a man, is we're supposed to be strong. Spiritually first, but also there is physical strength. That men are supposed to train their bodies for war. They're supposed to train for battle. Now guys, I'm 65 years old. When I went up that mountain, I was 64. And I've always been a big guy, but I found out later that after I got off that mountain, all the SEALs were giving each other a hard time and going, guys, we're 30 years old, Wes is 64, and he works twice as hard as all of you. And, you know, when you humble yourself, God honors that. He allows the respect to be there to lead men into combat. One of the reasons men follow me is because I don't, tell them to go to combat, I lead them into combat. We do not lead from the rear, we lead from the front. This is the way that we are supposed to behave as men. Guys, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah and tells us how he's been able to walk this life so purely. In Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16, he says, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers. I never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was heavy upon me. And this should be the heart of a believer. We should not sit among revelers. We should not be with those. See, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And again, part of being a man of God is you live a life above reproach. You know, one of my staff members said to me one time many years ago, he goes, you know, Wes, he goes, I noticed that young girls always feel safe around you. I said, that's because I look at them from the neck up and not the neck down. I said, most Christian men do not realize that when they look at a young girl, if she's pretty, they'll give her the once over. They'll look her up and down. They don't even realize they're doing it. It's just the way that they are. But it tells them something about your character. My wife told me probably about 10 years ago, she started saying to me, you know, honey, there's a lot of young women that like you. And I said, Biggie, that's ridiculous. I said, the women that like me, they're in wheelchairs. You know, they turn around like this, you know. I said, those are the kind of kind of women that like me. She goes, no, honey, there's a lot of young women that like you. And I let her realize that she was true. And the reason why, guys, is because young men today do not lead. They do not treat women well. They are very arrogant. They are very prideful. And she says, you're very good to women. You treat them well. You treat them with respect. I have a policy in my office that if a woman gets in a car, it doesn't matter if she's 6 years old or she's 90 years old, you have to open the door for her. If you don't, I fire them. That's a policy. I fire men if they will not do it. You have to live these type of lives. Guys, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah goes through hard times. In chapter 10, verse 23, and it doesn't read well in the King James Version, but it reads very well in the NIV. Jeremiah says, I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for man to direct his footsteps. It means that our lives don't belong to us. If our lives belong to us, then they do not belong to the Lord. The Bible says he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life will find it. Jeremiah goes through a lot of hard times, and from chapter 10 to chapter 12, he goes through a great time of discouragement. 
but he's at the point that he wants to give up. He wants out of the ministry. And you might think that God would say, Jeremiah, you've done a great job. Hold on. You don't know what the rewards of heaven are going to be like. Just stay firm. That's not what God says to Jeremiah. He says, Jeremiah, if the foot soldiers have reared you, how will you handle mounted horsemen? And basically, guys, he's talking about the times of old when armies went out to war. You have the foot soldiers. They come out there. They have a shield, a spear, a battle axe, or a sword. They have their armor. But then comes the heavy cavalry, massive horses with men on them in armor, massive shields, long lances. And at first the horses come out, and then they begin to charge. And when they come out, all of a sudden these lances come down like that. And it must have been a terrifying sight. And, Jeremiah, and what God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if the foot soldier has made you tired, how are you going to handle the heavy cavalry? What God is saying is, buck up, become strong. Quit acting like you cannot handle this. Grow up. And this is what we need to say to the church. Grow up and become a man. Be the person that God has created you to be. You know, guys, uh, we are involved in five different wars around the world. We are involved in Burma. We have one village where we have over 400 women that are widows because the Fulani Islamic tribes have come down and murdered all their husbands and raped all the women. We're involved in the war in South Sudan, and I've been there for 26 years. We're involved in the war in Burma, and we've spent over half a million dollars there alone just rescuing people. We're involved in the war in Afghanistan, but when the war in Ukraine came, I said to the Lord, God, am I actually supposed to be involved in another war? One of the problems was, is I had 40 missionaries in the Ukraine. They were a part of our ministry there. And I asked the Lord to speak to me through his word, and he did. In uh, Proverbs chapter 24, and verse uh, 10, it says, If you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? See, God says, I see. I know. And if you see people that are in trouble and in danger and you turn a blind eye, I will remember. See, God expects men to behave as men. You know, guys, I flew to Amsterdam on April 4th. I was meeting with our Dutch office. Uh, we do a lot of work in Afghanistan and the Ukraine. On April 6th, I had a dream. Now, let me state, this was a dream. I went to sleep that night and I had a dream. I've walked with the Lord for 46 years. In the 46 years that I've walked with Jesus Christ, I've only had three other dreams that I felt were for Christ. And guys, in my dream, there was a pastor named Billy Rutledge. He's a friend of mine. Billy will go anywhere in the world for the gospel. And of course, he was in the Ukraine. Well, he had gone missing in the Ukraine, so I was looking for him. And I got to a certain city, and I asked if he was there, and they said no. But they go, but there's a sniper here, and he's killing a lot of civilians. I said, well, guys, I was a professional shooter. I'll take care of this guy for you. And in the dream, I took care of him. I took him out. But I continued to look for him. And as I would go to city to city, they kept coming to me and said, there's snipers killing civilians. Well, every time I would go in, I would shoot the sniper. Finally, I got to a city, and they came to me. They said, Wes, there's a high rise here. And there's a sniper in this high rise. And he keeps killing people, but we can't get to him. And every time we approach the building, he shoots whoever's ever coming. I said, well, don't worry about it, guys. I will handle it. And in the dream, I, could, I, I, I entered the building with another sniper. And it's funny, guys, because in the dream, I knew exactly who he was. I cannot remember for the life of me. I've tried to remember who was this guy I was with, but I knew him in the dream. And I said to the guy, I said, we're going to clear it floor by floor. I'll take the lead. You follow up. Be very careful, because if we miss him, he'll come up behind us and shoot us. Well, I got up to the 16th floor, and I came around a corner, and there was carpet on the floor and sheet plastic, and it was moving. And I immediately raised my weapon to fire, because this is the trick of snipers to hide in a concealed position like this. But the Lord told me, do not shoot. So I stopped, and I approached it very slowly, because I thought there might be a sniper under it. And I reached down, and I pulled back the carpet. <clears throat> and there were four little boys under there, all between the age of about three and five years old. And they were so afraid. And I said, where's your parents? They go, we don't know. I said, do you boys want to come home and live with me? And all four got up and they came and they put their arms around my waist and they started to hug me. And guys, I woke up. 
was 4.30 in the morning. My wife had been up since 3.30. She was studying. And I had tears coming out of my eyes. I have never woken up in my life that I'm aware of with tears in my eyes. Matter of fact, Nikki was tremendously shocked because she's never, ever seen me cry in my life. Not once. And she came over. She goes, honey, what's going on? And, and I said, I began to retell her the dream. I said, Vicki, I felt like it had spiritual significance. I don't know why, but I don't know what it means. Am I, are the boys out there and I'm supposed to find them? What is the Lord trying to say to me? We, we agreed that we needed an interpretation. And guys, that's very true because when Pharaoh had a dream, Joseph interpreted. When Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, Daniel interpreted. So I went to some godly people and they gave me the interpretation. And basically what the Lord showed me was that there are thousands of people in Ukraine that have lost their family members. Parents went off looking for firewood, food, water, and they just didn't come home. And there are many, many orphans out there in the Ukraine right now. Matter of fact, people are committing suicide all over the Ukraine, especially among the elderly. And the reason they're doing it, guys, is because they cannot rebuild. Their pension is $100 a month. Their apartments are destroyed, and an apartment over there still costs at least 30000 for the very basic of apartment. When you get $100 a month, how do you rebuild? How do you eat? We're feeding 15,000 people every day right now in Ukraine, and we've committed to three months of that. We set up bread lines, and they were a half a mile long. And we started going house to house because we realized there were the elderly that couldn't get out. And we went to this one house, and we got there, and there was a woman there, and she said that she's going to commit suicide that day. And she said, you know, five or six years ago, my daughter was killed in a car accident, my first daughter. She said, when Russia invaded, my second daughter was in her apartment when a rocket or an artillery shell hit her house, and it vaporized her. They couldn't find anything. So she had decided to kill herself that day. Well, we shared Christ with her, and she surrendered her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now she said, I will not kill myself. I know my daughters believed. I know that I will see them again. But God wants his church to reach out and to care for those that do not have the ability to care for themselves. We are supposed to have a real passion for people, guys, that are suffering. Edmund Burke said, all that it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. I would say all that it takes for evil to triumph is for God's people to do nothing. See, we as men of God, we need to learn to have iron in our soul. Paul the Apostle in the book of Romans, he said, stir up the zeal that's within you. He means return to your first love. That time that you were so excited about Christ. And maybe some of you guys did not have that experience. Guys, when I got saved, it transformed my life. Uh, I'm the oldest of four boys in my family. My brother Rick followed me into the Marine Corps. He was also Special Forces. And Rick told my mother many years after I got saved, he said, Mom, when Wes left to join the Marine Corps, he goes, I did not want him to ever come back again. He goes, he was the meanest man I've ever met in my life. He goes, he would brutalize people. He'd beat them very severely. And he was extremely cruel with his words. And guys, what it was is I grew up where there were some gangs. And it was never 10 against one or one against one. It was 10 against one. So finally I got myself a German Mauser pistol. And I said, if I have to kill someone, that's what I'm going to do. And when I would fight, I would brutalize the person I beat up. And what I was trying to do was send a message, which was, leave me alone. And it worked very well. The other side of my personality, if a handicapped kid was being picked on, I would go to the defense of the handicapped kid. Truthfully, I was just someone who was lost, and I didn't know how to deal with the problems of life. But the gospel changed me, and the gospel is supposed to change you too. Paul said... Daily, they prayed for boldness. We're supposed to be sharing our faith all the time. It's not once in a year, once in a lifetime, once in a month. We're to look for every opportunity to share our faith with other people, to show the love of Christ, to lead them to the Lord. You know, Africa was not my first love. Matter of fact, guys, my first love was Russia. I spent five years in Russia as a missionary. And we have built seven Calvary chapels over there, We have probably 20 pastors we support. Guys, let me tell you something about the Russian people. They don't want this war. They just don't have any possibility of getting out of it. We have had one of our Calvary pastors rescue 39 Ukrainian families, got them through Ukraine, into Russia, into the country of Georgia. And these people are extremely traumatized. My staff said, Wes, the women's faces are swollen because they've cried for so many days. They're terrified. They don't 
know if their husband's alive, our children are alive. They don't know that they have anything to come home to. But we're ministering God's love to them. This is what we're supposed to do. But guys, one of the things about Russia, I love to go back to Russia during the wintertime. Because southern Sudan, it's always hot. I mean, it's always hot. But it's not just hot, it's humid. So you sweat 24 hours a day. The first, first four years, I lived in tents. It was like being in a sauna every night, you know. Now things have changed. we got solar power. So now we have some relief from this. But in the early days, it was very tough. Well, I would always go back to Russia around Christmas time. And the reason why, the biggest holiday of the year in Russia is not Christmas. It's New Year's. That's when they give gifts to their children. And see, Christmas is not celebrated on January 7th. Our, our December 25th is celebrated January 7th, Eastern Orthodox Christmas. Well, about five years ago, I was coming from a city called Yaroslavl, and we're driving through a blizzard. We had just bought a new car for a Baptist pastor. And as we're going through this blizzard, guys, the snowflakes are like the size of quarters. I mean, you can't even see to the back of the sanctuary. You can see that far with the headlights on because it was so thick. And what the Lord said to me is if the body of Christ does not intervene, Satan is going to harvest a blizzard of souls. And guys, that's exactly what has happened. Thousands and tens of thousands have been murdered and raped in the name of Islam. And as believers, God is calling his men to grow up, to become men. If you're a man of God, or you think you are, you should be sharing your faith all the time. You should be the financial provider for the family. If you don't have a job or a good job, then you get two jobs or three jobs. You do what it takes to take care of your family. This is the way men are supposed to behave. You give up the luxuries that you want so that you might take care of your wife and children. You don't take care of yourself until you've taken care of your family. You make sure that you give to God's church. You know, guys, it's interesting because when I went to the mission field, I thought I would be poor the rest of my life. I really did. But I did not care. I wanted to serve Christ. Well, God gave me a mind for business, and I started investing in the stock market. Two years ago, I made $10 million in the stock market. $8 million went to the ministry. About a million of it was in my retirement. About 300000 went to taxes. You know? <laughs> I think I got away with about 400,000 of it after it was all said and done. I don't need to work. I could go down and buy a house in the ocean in Mexico, which I love Mexico. I could buy any kind of exotic car I want, but I would be miserable. Why? Because I'm called to serve Christ. And see, one of the things you may not realize is you were too. See, in the book of John, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go. Guys, we're going to show you a DVD, and then I'll take a few minutes to close. In this DVD, you're going to see the Syrian church, our ghost operations. Afterwards, you'll see all of our chaplains that have been killed in God's service. Let's go ahead and show that, guys. the war start, many problems happen, and it's so difficult to continue the ministry. And uh, we know some, some day uh, the problems is come inside our homes, not just in our city or in our area. Uh, at that time, I speak to the leaders, and uh, we met together, and I said, as in Acts book, the believers, when they have the persecuted, most of them, they go out of Jerusalem. If you want now to go out of your area or out of Syria to save your families, this is good if God gave you this to do. But uh, we, we must to know maybe one day the problems come to our families and to our life. And maybe we will lose our life one day. You know, when I left the room and after the time I turned back to see the decision of the leaders 
I found 25 people. They stand there and they said, we will not leave. We will continue to serve God here in this area and we will continue the ministry. If we are die, we will go to Jesus. And if we leave here, we will be with Jesus. And you know, but they asked me something to do. They said, if one of our team died, you know we are non-Christian background and no one will take care about our body if we kill or something happened to us. Uh, what we can do if this happened? For that, we buy this land and we build a graveyard. This graveyard for if anyone killed from our team, we can put him there. This is the first building of our ministry. I think it's first uh, happened in Arraqqa city in Syria. They give the chance for the uh, Christian. They said to him, if you leave your Christianity now, you can be uh, hold your life, or if not, we will kill you. This, this decision is, you, you know, it's must to, to, to take directly. And most of the uh, Christians said, no, we are ready to die for Jesus. And for that, they, uh, you, you can see many uh, pictures about the Christian. They put them in the cross. And when they put them, many times they put in the uh, area, all the people can see them. To learn the people, if you will be Christian, this is your what will happen to you. Uh, and uh, most of the people, I thank God for these uh, heroes in the faith. They die for Jesus and they put them in the cross. You remember when I told you about the stories about the man who uh, with his son and uh, they bring them and they ask them to leave uh, them faith in Jesus Christ. But the father said no and the son said no. And they ask the father, if you don't uh, come to Islam now, we will, we will kill your son from of your, your eyes. And after that, they cut the head of the son and they start to play football in his head, front of his father's eyes. This is something incredible. You cannot understand what's happened. But through all this bad news, you can see the hope is growing between this uh, uh, difficult and uh, bad people. You know, Sometimes many people ask me why why you continue in the ministry in Syria, especially in this time in the war. The important thing for uh, for our life to be in God willing. This is our call from God to uh, to do the ministry in Syria. When we are inside the, the God willing, that means we are in the safe place. But if we are go out of God willing and go out of Syria, that means we are in the dangerous place. Maybe I, I can go like to Lebanon, to Jordan, to US, to, to anywhere and continue my life there. But that means I am go out of God willing. That means I am in dangerous. The important things in our life, not to be alive, but to be with Jesus willing. But if I am in inside the dangerous, but in God willing, that means I am in the safe place. This is my belief, and I trust in Jesus. He will keep my life, and when he wants me to go to him, I am ready to do that. This world. 
as of July 20th, John and Bill was shot and killed, bringing the number to 70 chaplains that we have lost in the service of Christ. You know, guys, as believers, we have this one precious life to serve Christ. If you throw it away, you will not get a second chance. When I was on the top of that mountain, there was a big realization that I could lose my life. But guys, when Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of your faith, you can have great peace. I realize that we follow the God of angel armies. As you leave here this morning, we want to give you an opportunity. And guys, the first thing that I want to say, if you'd like to do this, you cannot take it out of your church tithing, okay? You're a small church. It needs its tithing. We are an extremely large organization. I didn't come here because we need your money. We came here not that we might receive, but that you might store your treasures in heaven. We have 400 pastors in nine of the most dangerous Islamic countries in the world, but we have 300 more that are going out, and we need to raise sponsors to get them out there. In the Ukraine, we have a program called Potatoes for Grandmothers. We're actually going to send you a new grandmother. We're getting the testimonies right now. Guys, we actually started this in Russia. It was never designed to be big. It was only meant to be for 100, maybe 200 people. It was the people that went to Calvary Chapel or the churches that we worked with that did not have enough to eat. I would talk to people and they'd say, we get to drink milk twice a year. Meat does not exist in our diet. And so we wanted to take care of the body of Christ. Well, now there's thousands of these grandmothers and grandfathers in Ukraine. And if you'd like to sponsor one of them, they're both $75. This one's $75, this also $75. But then we built two castles in Africa. One is the chaplain space, one is a school for children. And the reason for the castle is to protect them from Islamic terrorism. We have 400 children in school, but we also have another 300 that need to go to school. Also $75. But guys, if you do this, it's an automatic debit. It's name, address, phone number, sign it at the bottom. You can use void checks, debit, or credit cards. Uh, Boydy checks work best because we don't pay fees, but you can use any of them. And guys, it comes out on the third of each month. You cannot pick them up and walk away with them. I will not know if they're sponsored. We don't put it on our website because we found out Al-Qaeda was following our website. And Al-Qaeda has what they have called kill sites. It's a website where they put up pictures of our people and say kill on site. So we've had to stop doing that. I share this with you. And, and guys, uh, there's always people that God has blessed in the body of Christ. There's people out there that financially they're just doing great. And so people will come up to me every Sunday and say, what if I want to do all three? Well, if you want to do all three, it's 225. We're not asking you to do that. But let me be very clear. If you cannot do it as a gift above and beyond without paying your tithing, please do not do it. Our ministry is a large organization. We're fine. This is only if you're one of those people who can. And I know there are people out there and you're struggling to make ends meet and it's very difficult for you to tithe. Well, then you've done your part. You know, guys, uh, I tithe, and the reason I tithe and gave to the body of Christ is I learned very early on what the Bible said is that if you would give your first fruits to God, He would open up the gates of heaven. And that's exactly what's happened in our ministry. The floodgates have opened up. In the year of COVID, I think almost all ministry thought they would lose half their support. Well, we started getting calls from all over the world, and people are saying we're hungry. So we're feeding people in Ukraine, Russia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. We're feeding in 17 countries. We're feeding 4,000 people in Mexico for, I think it was three or four months. And it was the biggest year of our ministry. We brought in $7.5 million. Well, last year, in the middle of the year, the Lord told me he was going to double our ministry. And I thought, how's that possible? It took us 23 years to get here, and he said he's going to do it in a year. Well, guys, then Afghanistan happened. And we didn't go to Afghanistan to raise money. But last year, we brought in $12.5 million. And right now, we're on course somewhere between 14 and $16 million. Can I give God? We'll be over there if you guys want to do it. But let me close with this. The Bible says, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. Guys, 
a lot of pastors are building their ministry, but you have a pastor that actually loves you and a pastor's wife that actually loves you. We call it a pastor's heart. I thought about being a pastor once, but I realized that you had to like people. <laughs> so I chose to be a missionary. But they love you. You need to get into the battle. You need to start sharing your faith. Every one of you should invite someone every week to come to church. Guys, if you do this, the church will explode. You will have no financial issues. You'll be at four services before you know it. You know, there's a statistic out there. They say 82% of people who are invited to church will come. 82%. If you go up to someone and say, hey, please come. And if you see me, come up and talk to me. I'd love to get to know you. I'll buy you a cup of coffee. You'll be amazed at how many people come. They say there's also a statistic out there that 98% of all Christians will never lead one single person to Christ in their life. It's very sad. I want to tell you guys, I do not know what the greatest desire of your life is, but I will tell you what the greatest desire of my life is. Being in five wars around the world, I suspect that I will not live out my natural life. I'll probably be killed someday in one of these countries. And when that day comes and I stand before a holy God and I look into his eyes for the first time, I want to hear him say, well done, son. Well done. And that's my prayer for you. You don't want to stand before Christ having nothing to show for your faith. You know, the Bible says God is going to wash away every sorrow and every tear. And pastors always say, well, that's for the loved one that didn't get saved. You got saved, but a parent or a brother or sister didn't, he's going to have to wash away those tears. I don't think it's what it is at all. I think it's when we see the lives that we could have had and we chose not to have. That's where God will have to wash away the sorrow. Would you come and close, Pastor Dave? God bless you guys. Well, you know, um, it's interesting as I was hearing him teach, um, right now we're going through a series of uh, preparing for battle. See, guys, this is what I'm talking about, man. Rising up, knowing that you've been called to battle. Um, and I don't know about you, but since I started teaching in Ephesians chapter 6, I've been under heavy attack, you know. Um, but the Lord has been carrying me, you know. Sonia has been praying for me. You guys have been praying. And, and, and it's crazy because it's been mental. Mental. And, and I knew this was going to happen the day that I say, you know what, we're going to speak on the, I'm putting on the armor of God. But you know something, guys? The Lord will give us victory. The Lord uh, has already won the battle. We're just, we're just engaging, man, and, 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 and allowing God to, to walk us through that, through that battle. But I encourage you guys, man. You know, uh, like my brother said, it's time to wake up. Men, it's time for us to rise up and engage in battle. Women, man, God bless you as, you, as, as you're rising up too, man, and you're coming alongside of us, and we're fighting together. To finish well. Amen. So listen. If you're here for the first time. Or you're watching online. And you've never given your heart to God. I encourage you to do that right now. And what I want to do. I want to ask you to bow your heads for a moment. And close your eyes. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. It's important that you make him your Lord and Savior. Because if you die without Christ. The Bible says that there's a place called hell. Where you will spend eternity. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, that he may die in your place. You hear me? So that you don't have to go to hell, but you may, but you may go to be with God for all eternity. But what makes heaven heaven is that you're going to be with Jesus Christ, the lover of your soul. So if you're here today, and I'm, I'm going to lead you in what is called the sinner's prayer, but you know that prayer does not save you. It's Christ who saves you. But through this prayer, you're confessing your need of him. And also, you're declaring him as Lord, which is mandatory for salvation. So I'm going to ask you, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, and then after we pray, as the music is going on, or maybe after the music, you can come to the front. There'll be some people here to my right, your left, who want to spend some time with you and give you a Bible so that you can take home and start to read. And then afterwards, we're going to encourage you, if you don't have a home fellowship, that you come back. And, and I promise you that we're going to give you the Word of God. You hear me? which will prepare you for this life, especially as we're living in the last days, as we're coming to the end of, 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 of life. We're going to prepare you for it through the teaching of God's word. 
So if you're here, whether there's a rededication or first-time commitment, I'm going to pray, and I want you to pray out loud with me. Church, you can join in. But I want you to make this your own personal prayer with the knowledge of that Jesus is the one who's saving you. Repeat after me. Say, Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know you came to die for sinners. You came to die for me. Forgive me of my sins and cleanse me. Come into me and give me a new life. That I may follow you all the days of my life from this day forward. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for accepting me. And forgiving me of all sin. Lord, thank you. In Jesus name we pray. And Lord, I pray for those who prayed. That Lord, that they may know that you have accepted them. But I pray that their life will now be a life lived in repentance. For we know, Lord God, that a repentant life, which gives evidence to a life that has been touched by you. Go before us now. And thank you for my brother, Wes Bentley, Lord, and the ministry that he has. I pray for your protection over him, Lord. I ask, Lord God, that you will continue to provide for him. I ask, Lord God, that you will continue to direct him, Lord. And, and Father, those brothers and sisters that are out there losing their lives, Lord God, to save other lives, physically and spiritually. Lord, that... Their sacrifice may put a smile on your face, Lord. Bless them, protect them, use them mightily. In Jesus' name we pray.